Recording in progress. Hey Tim, thanks for joining us. Um, let's go. Let's, let's go, Ron, Jay, and DJ. Hey Tim, how's it going this morning? What's up, Ron? So I asked Andy the same question, but uh, after the game on Saturday, he called it y'all's best rushing performance of the year. Uh, looking back on film, you know what made it the best rushing performance of the year? Well, I think um, it starts with just the mentality of the guys up front, and you know. I, had two weeks with the same group together, which seems like it's been kind of rare this year. Um, so maybe they're getting in a rhythm a little bit. And then also just kind of what the defense was uh, was doing. They were dropping eight guys into coverage pretty much the whole game and, and trying to take uh, Khalil and the guys out. Um, so uh, they were forcing us to run the ball. And, and our guys, you know, knew that for us to be successful, we were going to have to create a running game. And I thought our physicality up front and our tailbacks hitting it and kept it consistent. So it was uh, all the things we've been searching for. And by no means are we, are we there or uh, figured it out, but uh, definitely, definitely was better. Uh, a moment that I actually missed live in the game, but, but saw on replay uh, that there was a, a false start by Uzo Osuji early in the game. And John Ojuku kind of got into him a little bit there. You know, what does that say about John's growth as a leader and the ownership he's taking on this offensive line? Well, communication was going to be a premium in this game, Ron. Um, it was extremely loud. Um, obviously, it was raining there for most of the first half. And I thought that uh, really John and, and Stets together – uh, demanded communication from from the start of Monday last week until the game. And uh, a lot of our issues in the run game, uh, I really believed we were coming out of it the last few weeks. We ran the ball decent against Utah State. We ran the ball well against Nevada. But what got us was the pre-snap snap issues, the communication up front. Um, and so it was more about, hey, let's get that solved. And then we won't have these negative plays. And so I think John and Stets made sure that that was taken care of during the game and, and the communication was, for the most part, at a really high level. And in an environment like that, that was impressive. But he's been a good leader all year, Ron, and he holds guys accountable. He practices as hard as anybody. He demands a lot. And I know uh, uh, he was demanding a lot out of Uzo in that moment, which is which is good leadership. And uh, going back to the running game for a sec, obviously uh, Halani's banged up. Habibi Likio got banged up last week. I mean, do you expect to have either, either of those guys this week? And if not, how does that change your, your game plan? I, I don't know about that yet. It's too early in the week. I'm hoping, Ron. I, I'm really hoping that we have those guys, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, everyone everyone's beat up. Everyone's young. Everyone's thin. You hear a lot of coaches talk. They do the same song and dance. We're not going to do that. We're going to play the guys that are ready to roll, feel good about the guys we have. And uh, and we'll see we'll see where we're at the end of the week. But I'm always hopeful we have you know Cyrus and George ready to roll because those guys are good players. What do you lose when you don't have those guys? I think just you know we've talked about George's ability to just kind of make people miss at the line of scrimmage and turn like he'll turn the one yard run into a five yard run that a lot of guys can't do. Um, and then I thought Cyrus, you know, on Saturday was running really aggressive. I mean he was downhill, uh, moving the pile, getting behind his pads. So he's got that ability to. Um, still make guys miss, but I think he gets a little downhill as good as anybody right now. And so I think without those guys, plus they both catch the ball really well to the backfield. So um, just different styles with all the running backs, just kind of fitting the things that fit those guys best. Was, is, and we'll just have to adjust based on who we have. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Ron. Team, hey, what's going on? What's up, Jay? How are you? Chilling, man. Um, with uh... – if you go back and you look at Saturday's game, you guys get down 10 nothing. BYU plays that drop eight coverage. How important was it to stay patient and not try to start, you know, throwing bombs down the field and, and just being patient with what you guys did and running the football and, and kind of taking what they gave you? How important was it to just to be patient with that? That was that was really the game plan going in, Jay, that, uh, you know, BYU historically had has done that a lot. Now, recently, they hadn't done it a lot. They'd played a lot of man coverage, um, and we didn't know if they were going to do that. Obviously, you play man coverage against our receivers, you're, you're rolling the dice a little bit. So I think they only played, you know, less than 10 snaps a man the whole game, and the snaps they did play man were the snaps that you saw us throw the ball vertically. Um, and the rest of the game was just we're going to have to run the ball. We're going to have to be efficient and take the underneath passing game. And, and uh, I was really proud of our guys for uh, sticking to the plan, being disciplined, you know, and everyone wants to put up and look at stats and how many yards or how many points. But, man, if you, if you win the game, you're a winning offense, right, Jay? So it's just putting together a good game plan that's best for the team, not necessarily best for 
putting up stats or putting up numbers. And, and uh, I was really proud of our guys for – they understood to win that game. That was what we were going to have to do, and they stuck with it. And, and uh, our defense did a great job forcing some turnovers, and we knew that was going to be a big part of the game too. You kind of lead me to my next point. Like, it's funny, you look at the end of the day, 312 total yards, and it's like, ah, nothing to call home about. But you guys had short field positions. You ran the ball effectively when you needed to. You also probably had a couple less possessions in the game just because of how well you guys ran the football too. So uh, when you do win a game like that through physicality, as a guy that maybe some kind of assume is, you know, is a, is a spread guy that likes yep. to throw the ball up-tempo, like what, what goes through your mind when you, when you can win a game this way? I think it's just, you know, as you grow as a coach, you know, when I was a younger guy, it was like, man, I just want to score as many points as possible. And I don't really care what else is going on. And as you get older, you just realize – you got to do what you got to do to win that that game. Like, what do we need to do to win that game? And, uh, yeah, we didn't have a lot of possessions. In fact, there's been a couple of games this year we've had the least amount of possessions I'm used to. But I also think that you get in those kind of games and you got to realize the kind of game you're in. And that particular game, it was going to be us keeping our defense off the field with as banged up as they were um, and trying to control the game a little bit. And knowing that they were going to drop eight as much as they were, it was going to come down to just – Hank being smart, delivering the ball, and our tailbacks getting downhill and our guys being physical. And the bummer is, you know, obviously we kicked four field goals, Jay. So if those four field goals are four touchdowns, you know, that's 16 more points. Now it's 42 points. Now everyone thinks we're the greatest thing in the world, you know. So it's just – it's just sometimes you look at the stats, it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, but I think our guys did a great job of understanding what it was going to take for our team to win the game. And we played as a team, which was really cool. You know, th this just might have been some moments of the broadcast caught throughout this game. Uh, but it just seems like you and Andy um, are working pretty well together. I, and like I said, it just might have been a couple moments the broadcast just happened to capture. But how has your guys' communication and relationship as head coach, offensive coordinator kind of evolved as we, you know, are over halfway through the season now? Well, I think um... – like we said, when we first got here, I never really knew Andy, right? We just had the same mentors and the same thought process and the same beliefs, but um, being around him now for several months, there's not a person that I uh, respect more in, in coaching. Uh, I tell him every day how much he inspires me to be a better coach, uh, to be a better father, be a better man. He holds me accountable. He, he pushes me to be better, um, but does it in a respectful way. Uh, so he put he, he really creates a situation where you want to do really well for him. Um, and so even when we won the game, I just told him I loved him. I was super happy for him because he is a tremendous coach. He's a tremendous leader. And sometimes the outcomes aren't what we all strive for. And people outside maybe this building don't understand how talented he is, um, how inspiring he is and how much we all really love him. Uh, so for me, it's just, I want to do well for him. And so I do think our relationship is growing that way and just getting to know each other and what works and what's best for this team this year for us to win games in this season. And we're, we're starting to figure that out, I think, and hopefully we can, we can keep that going. Uh, one more quick one, Tim. Uh, Hank said that he's going to buy the offensive lineman steak dinners this week. Do you support that? <laughs> Man, I, uh, I don't know if he's got that NIL money or what's going on, but sure. He better, he better buy those guys something. They did a great job. The only sack we took was his fault. So he better buy him something. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Jay. How's it going, Tim? What's up, BJ? Not much. Um, I called it in my story that the, your most important, most impressive drive of the season, the one late in the game where they had just scored and cut it to six or whatever, and, and you guys, you know, needed that drive to use some clock. You go down there, Khalil makes that catch, but you get that field goal to go up nine. How important, just given the whole talk about the second half narrative and all that, and just uh, – being aggressive there and, and putting that game away, how, how how impressive was that for you? Huge. I mean, I think if you cut out the four-minute drive, I think we only had four drives in the second half, right? So um, I thought the drive to start the second half was really important, BJ, because we've had some struggles coming out of halftime, and that's been a focus of ours. Okay, for, so for us to have an eight-minute drive or whatever it was and basically run the rock was super important. And then, you know, they cut the lead to six, and, uh, you know, Andy and I just talked like, hey, you know, probably got to throw the ball a little bit here. Let's be aggressive. Let's not just let's not, you know, lean on one thing. Let's 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 be us. And uh, they played some man coverage that drive early. So I had a feeling they were going to keep playing man coverage and they were going to be aggressive. And 
So we, we caught them in some, in some looks where we could take advantage of it. The third down where we hit the shack and then, um, we were just kind of waiting all day, like hoping they would play man, hoping they would play man, hoping they would play man. And we finally caught them. And, and, uh, I mean, what, what are you going to say about Shaq? That can't be said. Big players make big plays. Um, and that's where we're going to try to get the ball to him in, in the biggest spots. And what a, what a tremendous play. That was, a, that was a great drive and championship drive. Wish we could have got a touchdown, though, BJ. Too many field goals, but we'll take it. After the, I know we've talked about the O line, but, you know, Hank mentioned like four times how happy he was for Coach Keen and for the O line because of the criticism they had been taking. And, you know, I think the criticism was justifiably so at times this year. But for them to, you know, I know the O-line always, that's just how it is. But for them to have a game like that and put it together when at this point, I think a lot of people thought maybe it wasn't possible at this point in the season to turn things around up front. What what just, what was behind the turnaround? And, and what what, do you, what does it say about Coach Keen and that group that they were able to have a game like that? Yeah, it's, it's uh, it has not been easy for those guys. And we tell them all the time, hopefully control what you're putting into your mind, right? I mean, control what you're taking in. And make sure what you're taking in is positive stuff, you know, turn your Twitter off or don't read some of the stories that are being written, you know, not no disrespect, but stay away from that stuff and, and just focus on the process of getting better. But I think for me, it's, you know, it's seeing the tears in OJ's eyes at the end of the game, understand how important it was for him to play a game like that. And um, I don't know if they're basing it on, on what's being said by the media or what's being said by the critics. I hope they're not, but sometimes it's hard to avoid that. Uh, Tim Keene's obviously been thrown through the ringer and and he's working his butt off to get this stuff fixed and we're all working together to figure it out but uh it's a, it's a collective effort BJ if we're not running the ball it's everybody you know and obviously the O-line is going to take the brunt of it and if if people want to sling arrows at coach Keen you know we're, we're big boys we can handle it but if we're not running the ball it's on the tight ends the quarterbacks the running backs the wideouts it's on all of us to figure that out and like I said, the unfortunate thing was I thought we were on the right track at Utah State. We were running the ball really well at Nevada, and it really came down to our communication and the negative plays. And so we wanted to solve that. And uh, we, we felt good about our ability to run the ball, even though no one else did. And I think it was just, again, I think it was emotional to see those guys at the end of the game feel like they, they got off to a good start. But again, by no means have we accomplished anything. Um, we can still run the ball better. We can still play better offense. And so... Um, it's back to the drawing board and see if we can get a little better this week. The Air Force defense, I mean, I know they had a lot of guys that didn't play last year and came back. And you look at a guy like uh, Vince Sanford coming off the edge, uh, you know, what, what stands out to you about what Air Force is doing defensively? Always extremely disciplined unit, right? And you wouldn't be surprised to say that word when you're talking about the Air Force Academy. And uh, But they're extremely disciplined in what they do. Um, they got some really good players up front. Number 94 is a tremendous player um, and really enjoy watching him on film. They've got some guys that have played a lot of football. So they're going to be very confident as they should be. Uh, they believe in their system and what they do. Uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tough effort for us to be able to move the ball consistently against those guys. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, I, BJ. I read my stories anyway, so no one does. It's all good. <laughs> Let's go John, Will, and Mike. Coach, how proud of Hank Bachmeyer are you right now? Just to talk about that a little bit, what he's been through and how he's leading this team this season. I mean, uh, he checked 15 plays at the line of scrimmage during that game, right? 15 times during the game, he got into a different play, right? Which is, that's what professional quarterbacks do, you know? And how hard is it when you have great receivers, and they're not going to let you throw the ball to them. You know, that takes a lot of discipline. And uh, I thought he played his best football game this year uh, by far. And the numbers aren't going to state that, right? 170 yards or whatever, no touchdown passes. But that was true quarterback play. That was, that was a high-level quarterback play. And still, you know, Andy and I are going to be all over him for the two or three plays he made where he, you know, goes John Wayne on us and gets crushed and gets the – intentional grounding you know we've got to we got to get rid of those handful of plays where he just goes John Wayne on us but everything Hank does he does out of just pure competitiveness so it's trying to wrangle in those few plays but that was that was high level quarterback play John high level quarterback play in that game I was very proud of him and and George Halani I mean just uh, the kid doesn't seem like he can catch a break here I'm sure he wants to be out there obviously like What's that like having to see him? Because you, know, you guys are all people, man. 
seeing this guy day to day practice in practice out when he can't go like how hard is that on on George personally and and the team uh anytime you don't have a player at the ability of George Halani your 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 team is not as good but when you, but the good thing is we still have George Halani around here the person right he can still impact our team by who he is first guy I saw this morning when I was in the training room early was George getting work gave him a big hug uh, his spirits are good I'm sure there's some things going through his mind that are tough, you know, being a guy that got hurt a lot when I was a player, I know how that goes, but uh, George is an impressive young man that goes beyond football. That's why he's on our leadership group. And uh, we expect him back this year at some point when he's back, we will be a better team for sure, but he's going to continue to lead off the field um, in the best way he can to help us. Thanks coach. Thanks, John. Hey Tim, for you personally, what was the most rewarding aspect of Saturday's win? Uh, the hug I gave Andy as soon as the clock hit zero, zero, zero. And I told him, hey, you just beat the number 10 team in the country, and I love you, and I'm um, super happy for you. That was a great moment. You mentioned the offensive line, the consistency of that group, having the same five starters. How much of a difference does that make week to week? I thought that was the biggest difference this week, Will, was that we could finally say, hey, we think we found something with these five guys. Um, and even though people were going to sling arrows after the Nevada game, a lot of that was not on them and how they played. It was operational things that we could fix that usually happens with a new O-line group. But we saw things in that game that showed physicality, showed high-level communication. We liked having Stetson and OJ on the same side. Uh, and so all of a sudden it was like, Hey, I think we found something here. And I don't know how many times I ran the ball left yesterday, but I know late in the game, I was steering that thing over to John and Stets. And, uh, and I think if I would have ran it the other way, they would have came and choke slam me or something. So I think, I think just finding the good combination there, Ben Dooley's doing really good at right guard. But again, that game last week, that was his first game at guard. Right. So just, I think that first game, there was a couple of things we had to work through, but them having another week together to prepare, and we had to make that decision last week really late. Now we had the whole week for them to practice together. I do think that helped us well, and if we can keep those five guys together and start to get some guys back, you know, maybe we can get some momentum going there. One quick follow-up there. One thing I noticed on the field is a lot of times during timeouts, uh, that five and, and Hank were huddled together and they're fired up. Uh, you could tell that they wanted to put it on their shoulders, that they wanted to run the rock. Do you notice that Saturday as well? Yeah, I felt I felt a, a vibe on the sideline, Will, from the whole team that was that was different. You know, we had we had some meetings going up to the game um, where guys were talking about what they wanted as a team, and so man, I felt I felt the offense when the defense was on the field. I felt the offense right there. You know, when JL got uh, got the targeting, you could see our whole team go grab him real quick. And then they went right to tubes and got him fired up. Uh, when I was calling the plays on the last drive, I had Riley Wimpy was like my hype man right behind me. Like every call I made, he was like, yeah, that's a great call. You know? So he's like right there hyping me up. So I just felt like uh, there was just a good, good team vibe during the game. We were all connected all three phases. Uh, and a lot of guys had to play on, in all the different forms. So I just felt a good vibe all together. But I think that that group of five was, was determined to, to run the football and determined to protect Hank. Uh, and they made that statement early in the week, and I thought they did a tremendous job of that. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Will. Hey, Tim, uh, Khalil Shakir. Every week he gets more catches, he gets more attention, he has more highlight plays. From your experience, how do you – how do you uh, – you know, combat that moving forward because there's going to be more attention from the defenses on this guy. How creative do you have to get so that production keeps going for Khalil? Yeah, that's going to be a focus all year, Mike, is just figuring out ways to get him involved. This game was going to be tough because if they're going to drop eight guys in coverage and put two on him, um, there's just not a lot of, there's not a lot of things you can do unless you can run the football and and be efficient and force them out of that, which is when he started getting some catches later in the game. Um, but I will say he – I've coached some talented wideouts, some guys that are getting paid to do it. And the one thing about him was even in the middle of that game, he overheard me saying something, I think, on the headset, like, hey, we got to find ways to get Shaq the ball. Let's find ways – and he overheard – he was the first guy to be like, coach, keep running the ball. 
If it's working, do not worry about me. Let's let's win the game. Uh, and if you guys know wide receivers, that is a rare statement, right? I don't need the ball. And I thought that was telling of who he is as a person and a leader. And that's why he'll play football for a long time because uh, he understands the team aspect. But Mike, if we don't get him the ball, we're not going to be as good. We got we to gotta find ways to get him touches. And uh, that's going to be a focus going forward, obviously, as much as we can. I know it's not the focus this week or, or even this regular season. We're going to do a segment later on on our show this week about his NFL future. You just talked about you, you've worked with guys that are getting paid and you know, is he on that trajectory? Is this, is this a no brainer as long as he keeps going and doing the things that he's doing? No brainer, no brainer. People would be crazy not to put that guy on their team, not because of how good of a player he is, but what he would bring to your environment as a teammate, as a leader. I could talk for hours about how special he is in those categories, not to mention all he does every week is make catches that I don't think many people in the country can make. He can play inside. He can play outside. He can block. He can punt return. He can kick return. He can line up at running back. Um, he can play wild. I mean, why would you not want that guy on your team? I would be shocked uh, if he's not getting paid to do this for a long time. And it's because of the mindset he has and who he is as a person. That's why he'll last for a long time. Tight end production. You're good for about one or two catches a day or a game from your tight ends. Is that by design? Are you trying to figure out ways to get them more involved? Are tight ends being asked to do different things? What's going on with that position? Yeah, I think I'm with you, Mike. It's 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 definitely not the design. You know, it's definitely not the design. We'd love to get those guys some more catches. And I thought this week was going to be the week because of all the drop eight zones. We were seeing that they'd get some underneath things. Um, and I know Ty Neal got one over the middle there, and then we hit Tyler on a long third down. We missed Riley on a couple. You know, I think we're just we're just not in sync there yet, Mike. We're I, you know we're trying to get those guys the ball in those zone situations. So this should have been the game where they got more, um, and for whatever reason they, we just couldn't get it connected. Uh, but th- we definitely want that number to go up, and uh, that's something we've been looking at during every week is how can we get that number to go up, especially with a guy like Riley trying to get him some more catches in, in space and get him going. And we just, we've missed him a couple of times the last few weeks. We just got to, we'll keep working on that and hopefully get him some more touches for sure. Tim, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Bob Beeler. Tim, when you set out to have a game plan, does it come the way you thought it would be or in, in this week in particular, or did it evolve as the game went along? And I'm speaking of the amount of times you ran the football. Was that something you thought you would do before the game started, or is it something to kind of evolve with the success and kept going? You definitely have a game plan going in, Bob, that that sometimes you go in and after the first drive, you just kind of tear it up and, you know, throw it away. Um, but this was one of those games where we knew going in, they were going to have to make a choice, just their style of defense. And we were ready for that choice. Like, what's it going to be? And we talked to our guys all week about, hey, let's just Let's prepare ourselves. It's going to be one of these two things. They're either going to play man coverage like they've been doing to Utah State and everybody else, and if they do, then okay, it's bombs over Baghdad. Let's roll, you know. But if it's if it's going to be drop eight and they're going to test us, then we're going to have to roll our sleeves up and, and get after these guys and be physical, and, and quarterback's going to have to be really humble and get through his progressions and get the ball to the backs and get the ball underneath. And um, I just – it was – early on you could tell it was like, okay, that's what they're going to do, especially when they got a quick lead – hey, why not do that? Let's make these guys run the ball and let's see if the quarterback can be disciplined. And they tested us. And and so uh, they were ready for it. And then they they executed the plan positively. Still some things we can get better at, Bob, but but, uh, they executed that plan well. A lot is made of Air Force's offense being so unique with the triple option. Is there anything their defense does that's unique? I don't know if there's anything their defense does that's unique that we don't see, but I, I do think like I was saying, they, they don't make mistakes. Like they don't, they don't drop guys in coverage. You know, they don't miss tackles. They do all the things that good football teams do, right? They, they're gap sound. They tackle extremely well. They force turnovers. If you're sloppy with the ball, they get pressure on the quarterback. They do all the things that a good football team does, which doesn't surprise you. I think their, their offense gets a lot of the headlines because man, they run, they run the snot out of the ball and they're going to hold on to the ball for a long time. And make it tough on a defense, Uh, but you can tell they have a team mentality and and it's obviously not surprising with the type of kids they get at their program. And um, so we know the the test we have this week is, is a big one. Uh, We can't be resting on what happened 
yesterday, you know, we always say the, the easiest, the easiest day is yesterday, Bob, you know, <laughs> there's a challenge today, every day, we got to meet that challenge and find joy in that challenge. So the easiest stuff's behind us. We got to, got to move forward. Good luck this week. Thanks neighbor. Mm -hmm. Tim, appreciate the time. We'll, we'll get you out of here. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Have a good week. Thanks, Tim, love that out.